welcome everybody to the third degree and especially to copyright and your thesis. Uh, it's great to be with everyone tonight. So thank you for joining us here in our weekly webinar series for research students. First of all, I am going to have to make an apology. Tonight's topic is definitely not a lively one. It's actually super boring in many respects, so don't expect jokes. It's somewhat uh, technical and procedural in nature, and therefore by default becomes rather dry. But understanding where we stand as researchers with the fundamental issues of copyright is extremely important to our growth and to our development as researchers. And ultimately, it makes us stronger as researchers, as communicators, and as authors. If you find that tonight's webinar helps you sleep, drop my team an email and I'll send you the link and that will help you with future nights of insomnia. Anyway, let's move on to the discussion and copyright and your thesis. Knowledge is valuable. Researchers build on established knowledge and on research results and thoughts communicated by their peers. An intrinsic part of being a researcher is publishing and disseminating one's own work. But this also involves questions of authorship and rights. And that's what we're here to focus on this evening. Through the discussion, I'm going to take four perspectives or four viewpoints, perhaps, from where we stand. The author perspective, the co-author or shared authorship or shared ownership perspective, because not everything we own ourselves in terms of the research that we've done. I'm going to take an institutional perspective and finally an end user perspective. Ultimately speaking, an academic author should know how work is protected by copyright, what it means to assign or transfer copyright to others. And I think that's probably the biggest eye opener we have out of tonight's session. And finally, how to avoid infringement of other authors' copyright. In our undergraduate years, we'll call it plagiarism. But in terms of a thesis and full-on publication, whether it be a thesis, a journal article, a book chapter, or a book itself, out of our research journey and journeys, it does become copyright. So why do we need to understand copyright? In the academic context, copyright is primarily about getting the most from your scholarly work. And it's less about the legal complications with threats and possible liabilities. Attention to detail and attention to copyright helps to avoid pitfalls, but it also can reveal opportunities for us as we further our scholarly goals. Given the way that the law operates, copyright law most certainly protects our dissertations as well as the quotations, photographs, music, diagrams, or any other work that you have included in your doctoral study. The decisions you make about copyright can directly affect the quality of your work, your ability to publish your dissertation, and your opportunities for building upon years of research throughout your career. Let's start off by considering a few common practical examples of copy, copyright's relationship to your dissertation. In the academic context, it's primarily about getting the most from your scholarly work and less about, oops, sorry, my, ah, my copy and paste went badly there. Let's start with three particular case studies. Photographs, art, and architecture. Very simple. Alice is completing her dissertation on art and architectural history and wants to include a variety of photographs drawings, and artistic renderings from throughout the 20th century. Nearly all of these works are protectable by copyright. We can ponder whether it is live. When a copyright owner does not show up to object, object, it becomes a serious nuisance or even worse. At the very least, Alice may find herself scrambling to secure permissions or dealing with objectives, objections sorry, as they arise with the ensuing prospect of modifying her dissertation or blocking online access to it. Alice's solution? With a little advanced planning, she can explore her options, evaluate fair use, secure any needed permissions, and even find alternative images that are in the public domain or licensed for these particular uses. 
including the many issues available on the web with Creative Commons licenses, something we'll talk about later. Attending to copyright matters early can prevent complications and delay in filing her dissertation. The reality here is just because it's available doesn't mean we're actually allowed to use it. And this gives uh, evaluators an opportunity to pick us up on something that we've forgotten or omitted or failed to do. Let's take a look at a second scenario, a chemistry journal article. Belinda successfully published two articles in leading chemistry journals during her years as a graduate student. When the journals were originally accepted for publication, she and her advisor were delighted. And Belinda was happy to move the articles as quickly as possible towards publication. She's now preparing her final dissertation and it will include full reprints of the two articles. However, she only now realized that her four publication agreements with the journals included a transfer in full of the copyrights. She may be the author, but she no longer holds the right to reproduce the articles in a dissertation. What's her solution? By understanding her own rights as an author and taking greater care with publication agreements, she could have avoided this situation. Most journals would probably support her dissertation, but she now needs to find the right contact for each journal and clear the right to use even the, her own articles that she has written. A little bit of advanced planning when she originally published the articles would have been best. We all seek to have as many relevant publication opportunities as possible, but we've got to make sure that we don't cut our nose off to spite our face in the sense that we may hand over the rights to uh, the academic property they're in before we even get to use it for our genuine purpose, which is our thesis. And let's take a third scenario, a third case study, a scholarly book on Asian literature. Carlos is filing his dissertation on comparative Asian literature and is pondering the various choices for open access and creative commons. Carlos is a strong supporter of open access to information and his university requires that dissertations go into a digi the, the digital repository. That means the, his dissertation when complete is available fully online. His advisor is cautioning him that some university presses might not publish a scholarly book based on a dissertation that is easily accessible in the internet. Carlos's solution. He has an opportunity to make careful and informed decisions about the management or stewardship of his own copyrights. He needs to be able to, to anticipate his future plans, investigate the alternatives, and make well-informed decisions. Most publishers do not balk at a work based on an open access dissertation, but a few may. So reactions will vary widely amongst the publishers and amongst the disciplines. Carlos should also evaluate his option about open access, temporary embargoes, and different uh, commons licenses. He might explore non-traditional or innovative publishers that have adapted to more flexible terms. By recognizing his rights as a copyright owner, Carlos is positioned to better manage his work, allow appropriate access, and preserve his opportunities for future publications. The situation here becomes the fact that we want to try and get derivatives out of our publications, but they may not be economically viable for the publishers that we are engaging with. And therefore, we've got to plan in advance for these possibilities to work out what is the best strategy to get the outcomes that we as researchers want. You'll notice that through the three scenarios, they're not filled with legal threats and allegations. In fact, very few copyright matters in higher education will ever get to that level. I mean, we should be grateful for that, but the scenarios are really about two other concepts. First, they are about respecting copyright. It's integrity. Copyright is part of the process of creating and sharing research. We need to respect the copyrights of others. We also need to show respect for our own copyrights through careful management and careful planning. And secondly, it is about the advanced planning and strategic choices that we make as researchers. Solutions to the copyright concerns in each case are possible by learning a little bit more about both the law, alternatives, and then making informed and reasoned decisions 
that can help prevent problems before they have a chance to interfere with what you're doing or to stall the filing of your dissertation. So although tonight's topic is a little bit dry, this, these are the areas that I want to explore and help you with so that you can better plan for the future as well. So let's start about the fundamentals of copyright for dissertations. What do we really know about copyright? So we'll start with the following core principles as they are applied. Your dissertation is protectable. That means copyright law, regardless of pretty much whichever country you are in across the world, will always protect original works that are fixed in some medium. For example, they're written on paper, stored in a computer drive, sculpted in clay, recorded on tape or other media. We have to remember that not every PhD is a 1000 page written document. Sometimes it can be a work of art. Sometimes it can be code in a computer program. There's a lot of opportunities here. Because you wrote your dissertation using your original words or other expressions, you have fixed it in various ways. Your dissertation is therefore protected. It's very seldom that you'd have a situation that it's not. It's usually protected automatically, but some will argue whether you should register or not register with say, for example, the Copyright Office, uh, depending on your local, uh, your local area, your country, um, or even the need to put a copyright notice on the dissertation. Because it's copyrighted upon creation, these aren't necessary, but these type of procedures and formalities actually may be a good idea, and we'll talk more later, but they aren't required. You are most likely the copyright owner of the output, but just let me give you a thought here, you may not necessarily be the copyright owner of the data that you used to generate the output. So it usually as copyright, it vests initially with the person who created the new work. In theory, if you wrote it, you might. But here's a problem. And some of us have faced this in the past. It is possible that you may have entered into a funding or an employment arrangement that would place the copyright that you thought you had actually with someone else. So you need to review the agreements that you have carefully. You can decide how to publish your work. Students need to consult their advisors, university officials about policies, and also about policies relating to depositing dissertations with the university and possible embargoes or postponements on public release of your dissertation. As long as you hold the copyright, you are in general able to decide how your dissertation can be made available, whether it be reworked into a book or divided into a few journal articles. You get to make those decisions. But it may not work that way if you publish in a journal first. And if you give away your copyright, as some publication agreements require, you can lose all of those opportunities and privileges. So you need to be able to decide on this. At the same time, you also have the privilege of allowing use. So it's not a one sided thing because other researchers are going to develop from the work you have done and maybe use elements, either a small amount or a large amount of what you've got. And you can create or attach, sorry, a Creative Commons license to your work that permits public use. The works you include from other sources are also copyrighted. Just as the law protects your dissertation, it also protects everything that they've had with that. Now let's have a look at authorship and copyright. Oh, sorry, let me just go back. I wanted to mention one story, uh, one thing that happened to me several years ago, too many years ago. The scenario with having an employment contract, if you are working for a university, there is a possibility that your university contract means any works that you create during your employment with the university. The copyright lies with the university. Now that happened for me when I worked at Auckland University. 
that a lot of the original uh, resources that I was creating that I'd wanted to be able to turn into books, I was reminded that under, um, under my employment contract, anything I wrote at my time in the university, copyright and therefore the revenue streams actually were aligned to the university and not to me. Now that was something I wasn't aware of at the time I became employed. Uh, I was definitely younger, so I, I, I learned very fast. But it also became a negotiable point for future contracts as I had to make sure that I still had rights to something that I had created. Anyway, let's move on to authorship and copyright. According to copyright law, the basic criterion for claiming copyright protection of your work are the work has to be literary or artistic. So a book, a thesis, an article, a map, a drawing, or even a painting. It has to be original and creative. This doesn't mean uh, something absolutely fantastically new and artistic, but what it actually means is it has to be something that is new knowledge. You cannot copy whole or parts of somebody else's work and use it as your own. We know that from plagiarism perspective, but there's also the opportunity that we can get it from another researcher who has passed on or chosen to hand over research. That doesn't necessarily give us copyright. And the work has to be fixed in some form, so such as writing, illustration, etc. You have to contribute to the expression of the work in order to claim authorship. The author must make a substantial contribution to the actual writing of the text. Contribution in other ways does not count as authorship under copyright law. So you may be in a situation where you have a research assistant that is actually contributing to what's happening within your, the research. But if they haven't done the writing, for example, they don't get second authorship under copyright law. If there are two or more authors, though, whose individual co contributions to the work can't be separated, they get copyright jointly. Now, that doesn't apply to a thesis, but it may apply to anything you uh, manipulate your thesis to create. For example, uh, journal, uh, journal contributions or book chapters or so forth. In some instances, too, you don't have the economic rights to your work. You, you may be the author, but you actually don't get the benefits from that. That means you may not always retain the exclusive rights of the copyright holder, which include the ability for reproduction, distribution, public performance, communication to the public, or even transformation. So it's really important right from the early phases that you understand if you are giving up any rights, and how that's going to impact upon what you want to do further down the track with both your research and your thesis. Our rights depend upon the transfer of rights by contract. For example, work that's performed in an employment relationship or signed away to a publisher. You know, for example, a clause in an employment contract with a university stating that your PhD dissertation has to be made available in the institutional repository, or what's called considered green open access, or your funding organization has an open access policy included in their contract, you know, stating that your work has to be made freely available online in an open archive. That affects what you can get, or what, how you may benefit either financially or otherwise from the scenario. The term of the copyright as well. Usually copyright lasts anywhere between 50 to 80 years after the year of the death of the last author of the work. So in our lifetime, we're unlikely to uh, lose because of the time period, but noticing that every country does it differently. So I come from New Zealand. We've always had, uh, I think, 80 years as being our main number, but looking around the world, the number changes. After the death of the final person, plus the X number of years, the work then falls into public domain, meaning it's free to use by anybody, but you still have to acknowledge the author. 
So there are a lot of 150 year old manuscripts out there that we can make use of. Challenges, would we really want to? Probably not. And finally, we can actually transfer rights by inheritance. So if the author dies, the rights to reuse the work might pass on to relatives, especially if it's not fallen into the public domain. Now, this is going to be really important for us because we might find a diagram or something that we want to use, but the author of the text, the author of the manuscript has passed away. In that case, we don't just assume that we have the rights to use it. We may actually have to seek permission of a relative or other individual to whom the rights have passed on to. Now, these are a lot more complicated than, say, the undergraduate years where all we're doing is avoiding plagiarism. What we're now trying to do is avoid any form of academic theft, and it's simply respecting the original author or the original contributor.